most of you know the Locus Roundtables, but essentially it's open format discussion and topics in contemporary art, proposed and moderated by members of the art community and beyond. Um, I was very pleased to introduce Lucy Carlisle. There she is. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes um, at Locust, um, well, it's nice that we can tie in programming um, with some of these talks. So I'm um, very happy to introduce uh, Felicia and Valerie George, Felicia Carlo and Valerie George, in conjunction with their present exhibition in the project room and, of course, in the front gallery called Sounding Room. Um, and so this, this, um, this talk is also um, going to be accompanied by like some play that we'll engage in afterwards and you know uh, however which way we we you know want to do that is fine <laughs> and um, it's also I'm very happy to introduce a new component of our programming called which is um, basically an activation of our library of contemporary art books um, and the first activation of that is um, artist Alan Gutierrez and the journal that he's produced, um, text-based journal called Line Script Diary, which is launching in cities all over the world actually right now. Um, we're very happy to be the Miami launch, um, so feel free to check out the journal. Um, and the journal will also um, be present in the library um, for the next month and a half, two months or so, and we will have it in our collection ongoing. Um, there's also an audio component of that journal, um, which we will be playing at later roundtables, the next two ones going forward. So I also serve as a bartender. And I'll also be a bartender. <laughs> exactly. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, and then obviously everyone knows about the roundtables, like in terms of everyone, you know, speaking. But Felicia and, and Valerie will conduct the roundtable as they I'm see totally fit, and we'll, you know, people invite you to speak at moments where it's, it, it feels right so you guys can conduct it any which way you want to do that okay. and um, last my last little bit is that I'm just gonna pass around these clipboards at one point like after or before and if you mind scribbling down a little bit of information that would be very helpful to us going forward so thank you thank you welcome, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're hoping that you guys won't mind um, being sort of a test group for us <laughs> Um, as we start on a path toward discourse about this exhibition. Um, Sounding Room is a place that Valerie and I set out to uh, create for our friends to come and play with us. <laughs> um, uh, how much more fun can art be, right? Um, we used our two discrete sculptures, the string piece and the mic room, along with our drums and cymbals to anchor the show while we asked artists we wanted to work with to join us in filling up the space with work that somehow resonated with our own um, and their individual practices think while they're thinking about sound and performance. Together, 10 of us are building a collection of works, a series of performances and events, and a body of knowledge through discursive practice. Tonight we're testing out for the first time how some of our collective ideas might resonate with an audience. We want to do that by asking questions and looking at text with a big dose of poetic license um, and a small dose of whiskey. So <laughs> we'll be passing around um, whiskey shots. You can take it or not if you wish. Um, so the first question we have for you all is how does sound make community? Language. Through language, okay. Yeah, like sound, like that's how we communicate. Mm -hmm. Right? right. You and Nikki. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And how might those voices or that sound be delivered at different times in different ways? Well, it requires two sides of conversation. Active and listening side. Listening. Yeah. The word comes up a lot for us how to listen, when to listen. So without listening, there is no community. Um, what else? Well, does listening have to be active? Like environmental listening. You know, like when you're in Times Square, you know you're in Times Square. You know, Are you listening? Or Miami, yeah. That's the question. Are you hearing? You know. Mm -hmm. Well, the interesting thing about sound is you and um, like if you're looking at something and you don't want to look at it, you can just close your eyes or look elsewhere. But sound is sort of something we can't block. So, Not that way, yeah. Right. So, in like when a car alarm is going off in your neighborhood, you are subject. 
adapted to it, whether you like it or not. But you can tune stuff out, though. That's my dad and his amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. But, I mean, you can tune it out, but really, it's ha it, the sounds are going into your eardrums and bouncing off the whatever is going on in there. But, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I guess that's the point I'm trying to make. You're obliged to hear others. Um, but I guess, are we talking about sound, as in music or noise, or like the voices of community, like at town hall meetings? We're talking about sound as communication in any way. Oh. So, or sound how, or specifically how sound might have made right. community in history right. or historically. Well, also precisely you know? because it's not visual, it's also like emotional. Like it's understood emotionally. And that's a very powerful, a powerful tool. I think that, you know, I guess we're, we're making a difference between sound and music, right? Yes. Um, but I do think that like um, sound slash music is very important. Um, I want to take in a very important position in ritual. Mm -hmm. uh, not only like religiously, but also even when you think about wars, you know, and, and drumming. Distraction. But, but even with that annoyance, you're building community. You know, when you find something annoying, it's like people start gossiping. So that's a way of building bonds. Right. <laughs> yeah. It is very hard to um, contain sound. It, we use the word bleed a lot. It bleeds into other environments, and particularly into white cube spaces like this. It, it bleeds out onto everything around it. So it's a really... It's, it's interesting to think about sound in terms of that. But as a, someone who's been in bands before, when I think about community and sound making community, I do think um, about the experience of being in a band and the small community that's made in that tiny little room. But then as people who love you, support you, come out, want to make music either like you or with you or play shows with you, and, and it's, it's like dropping a pebble into a into a pool of water, the ripple just keeps expanding, and I love that, that sense of growth. And I found in this project in particular, it's growing in that same sort of way, the community is growing in that way as well. So, I think Those are kind of things that like function outside of the actual sound. Mm -hmm. What? Just like the social dynamic or admiration or audience person to perform over. Right. I think we used we just chose sound as a catalyst because we wanted to work with it, you know. Um, and for me, the idea of, um, well, I can roll it back to two years of living in a communal situation with other artists, the artists coming in for two months at a time, right? Um, and you build relationships and then they fly away to their next respective place. And um, when I started this work, uh, I was kind of like solving the problem of loneliness in a studio and like feeling like okay what kind of sculpture can I make that will actually bring people here and <laughs> you know be productive so um, anyway uh, sound is improv Rise yeah play. Mm -hmm. play, is. play is productive mm -hmm. and play became um the way that I started to connect to groups of people and build networks of people in my life um, that I could work with and hopefully, you know, um, at times be serious, you know. So I think it, um, it led to, you know, this and a more um, framed kind of um, discourse around it, I think, or just using the gallery to frame it and make it, give it a, a house mm -hmm. um, to live in for a short time. Um, so, my, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say that my interest in this project and collaborating with Felicia in particular 
had to do with something very similar. I was, um, I live in Pensacola, Florida, which is a relatively isolated artist community and an even more isolated sound and noise community. Um, and while I have a beautiful group of colleagues that I work with at the university there, the people that I wanted to reach out and connect to lived all across the country. So I found myself not being a studio artist at all, and I built a studio in my car, drove around the country, and recorded people that I um, worked with. Um, so put thousands of miles on the car and enjoyed it thoroughly, and I made community that way. Um, in fact, Eli is someone that, uh, someone that we're bringing in on Saturday. Eli is someone I met on that tour. Lairhoff, Eli Lairhoff, and, um, and his brother. So his brother and I made a recording together. Um, so for me, it was really nice to think about the fact that we could make that, make a home base for people who have similar interests, but distant or um, different enough to bring a really strong sense of variety to the show. But it was really nice to think about um, using this place as a safe home base and it wasn't quite as, um, it's not so mobile, obviously, as, as the car was, but it's nice to bring people here. That changes the dynamic too, and, and it's an, an interesting opportunity to have a little bit more control over the sound <laughs> too, um, and the way that it, that it, the way it literally sounds, um, as opposed to moving around the country and reporting out in the world and all of that. Yeah, but both are generative, so. Yeah. You know, Valerie was um, using her car as a recording studio and and sort of like finding spaces in the landscape. Um, and we came together and made a space. You know, either way, it needs a, a house. It needs an architecture. It needs a place. Um, and so I think that very strongly ties in with the idea of community and uh, community building. Um, right? I mean, architecture, you build the bench, people sit on it, you build the house, they will come, right? So, um, so that was the impetus behind, you know, putting these objects in one place and building a space where people could come and make noise and make sound and, and find some kind of, you know, connection through that resonance. Um, and so we're thinking a lot about resonance and we're thinking a lot about listening and, um, we're, we're talking about this book that um, was written by Francis Dyson, um, and it's new. It just came out of MIT, and we just started reading it ourselves. So that's why I said, you know, it's kind of an experiment to conflate the exhibition with this, you know, text that starts to outline some of the things that we're interested in um, in terms of sound. Um, and so here's an excerpt that I'll read to you. Um, Timely. Is time. Timely, yeah, it's of the times, yeah, right? The tone of our times. Why is that, you think? I'm curious. That the reviews say timely? Yeah, why is it Because it, it needed to be written now. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I was thinking like the sound production, uh, is it now like considered or it feels more communal because of this like band culture, you know? like. Like, you could think, like, I don't know, like, SoundCloud is a house which is yeah, a venue it's a, yeah, or Yeah, a virtual whatever. place. So uh -huh. He's kind of like, yeah, he's kind of like dynamics of, like, making these sounds or playlists and being able to share it and, like, create these kind of, like, fan bases. Like. That's true. Like, the network is, it's not like we, you know, making an, a mixtape for a friend and handing it to them. But even, like, a mix, like, the idea of a mixtape is, like, architecture. Mm -hmm. like, okay. It could be, yeah, I think it could be... Like no one wants to make the sound like to not be heard. But there's right. also a need to like, you know, you want to share your organized group of sounds with someone else because that is an expressive. That's expressive of something. I mean, it's the same as painting, like. Well, and to, paint but it's but yourself. it's using a different sense. It's than painting. Well, because it's more participatory in the sense. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I think we're still thinking about it. I think that's why maybe that the, that the reviews say it's timely because I think that, um, well, I think it was proven the night of the opening that um, 
there's confusion around how to interact with this kind of work. What's yeah, there was. It was. Um, it, you're, it's unknown. You know. Do I think the audience didn't know when to listen? They didn't know when to shut up and and go. You know, and stop their conversations, or they didn't know. So like they didn't. We yeah Crowd we were performing yeah people. but the voices just overtook right. it we didn't was it like you know and or was it like some right something you should pay attention to right or something that is just happening that's ambient in a space right. and that's kind of like the funny thing about music as yeah. opposed to sound it is right yeah and then also the the, the tension about well can I play too or yes. are these people perf- or is this a performance that I am not privy well, and we found that nobody really and even bothered with the question. They skipped past to the answer, and that's yes. You know, it's inviting <laughs> me to attack it and bang on it because it, it makes me it. feel like I need to. <laughs> right. Like all of a sudden, there's this like aggression right. that you ne- d- that I didn't expect, agency, and a boldness and like agency. agency, right? And I think it's interesting. Like we just had this um, program for children this past Saturday, and like. Obviously, children are excited. They have agency in any case, of right. course, like before it, it gets beaten out of them or whatever, <laughs> or, you know, socialized out of them. But um, but to see them, like, really going for, they didn't, you know, they were immediately like, this is a platform for me to use. Mm-hmm. It was very exciting to them. There was no question. And there was, they had no inhibition. Oh, they had hesitation. I watched individual, especially the girls. Uh, they had hesitation, people. and then... You know, once they thought, well, nobody can really hear me because everything else is a cacophony. Uh, Nobody's going to hear me do this. And, they and then they would go for it. And then they would just totally loosen up. Yeah, the kids and, did interactively. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. On they Saturday, they, they made noise for three hours straight, and it was cute. <laughs> Well, and it, it's our situation. Well, it's our situation to be in a visual culture that is where we are. Um, but as you mentioned, in previous civilizations, sound was a priori. It wasn't. It was above the visual sense. It was, you know, speaking through drum beats, speaking from distances, having you know a different language, uh, using sound as a language itself from distances so um and there's a lot of you know that's that's a lot of that's off the topic but um (laughs) so i wanted to read out loud this this bit of text that um to me speaks to all these things um and specifically resonance listening has been listening has been tethered to reception the demos of democracy the open space of public debate is now wireless and it, this speaks to what you're saying about soundcloud and uh, the resonance of voice wind material objects bodies vegetation etc has been exiled to places without people while discourse and debate now travel the currents of social media confined to brief snippets of text and 30 second sound bites while the populace ears plugged dwells within the confines of soundproofed and acoustically regulated walls resonance with its attributes of sympathy empathy and common understanding is reduced to echo the shallow repetition of the loudest voice in this day and age the loudest voice does not necessarily represent the common people It does not resonate with their wishes nor engage with their demands, but responds to markets, currency trading, flows of money, bond rates, and credit ratings. Um, And so I think, you know, just in that little bit, it's it's, it's sort of opening up that discussion um, towards what kind of sound are we hearing, what kinds of communities are those sounds forming, um, and are you really hearing? There's a, a. I think you would like this book. There's a. There's a portion in it that is talking about the kind of um, 
uh, when sound is mediated that you're listening to the media, you're not necessarily listening to the actual sound. So, you know, being in the room and feeling the vibration of air against your eardrum and being, you know, flesh bodies in real space um, is, is counterintuitive now. So, in my opinion, I think we're trying to work against that with this work, you know, and bring something that is more um, acoustic rather than digital. So, building a space being with the sound, relating with our bodies again, you know, and involving our bodies, I think is, um, I think that's always been important to both of us yes. in terms of, of our past work and, mm -hmm. and what we're, we're about. So, um, I think it's interesting to think about um, orality being mediated, um, thinking about, I don't know how much you guys know about divorce theory of um, society of the spectacle, um, but just thinking about how visual images are mediated for us, so what we see and what we know is not necessarily everything there is to know, obviously, same in terms of orality. So um, I think that it's kind of interesting to think about these theories, um, like the spectacle, uh, in in, our, in terms of orality and sort of visuality, if that makes any sense. Could you unpack that a little bit more? It's quite, well, a, it's quite a thing to just Wikipedia. <laughs> it is quite a thing. Well, you know, I just wanted to throw, like, yeah. when you say words like divorce, I just want people to see how to, to spell it or whatever. I'm no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you go down the Wikipedia rabbit hole, we're just like. Well, the, yeah, that's that's what I'm doing over here for you. I'm mediating <laughs> for you very much um, this information. But I'm not sure. What do you mean? What do you want me to unpack? Well, uh, you know, I think I think this is a great point, and I, I kind of want to just get into it a little bit more. That's all. Well, um, I talk about the Society of the Spectacle a great deal in one of the courses that I teach at uh, West Florida, which is a, a course called Non-Place, and we talk about the difference between place, space and non-place, and um, we talk also about Auger's theory of non-place, and uh, Foucault's theory of heterotopias, or heterotropic spaces. So we talk about essentially the spectacle and, and reference to that, and how we um, have sort of, as a viewing culture, as a culture that is one that passive. looks as very passive, um, that our ideas of happiness, life, popularity, success, whatever, it may be, are essentially given to us, fed to us, mediated to us, and this is divorce theory and from, I guess, the 50s, however, um, or 1960s, however you can um, easily translate this language directly back into our 2015 culture. And so uh, certainly um, things that Debor talks about are, are problematic, some of them, um, but others hit home for me. Um, particularly in, in terms of the way I choose to live my life. So I think about these, these sort of ideas um, about visual culture as an art maker, as an object maker, as a, as, a thing, as a maker of things that you look at and experience. I'm conscious of what I'm mediating to you. So on purpose, you know, when it comes down to sound and orality, I wanted to be able to create something that we could um, at least for my contribution to this space, something that um, was, in the end, I created a, a sculpture or, or a grouping of objects, but in the end, the product is has to be made by whoever puts their voices to it. So, so instead of being passive active. Yes, and so that was one of the things that I was really interested in, was sort of bringing that activity back into the, um, instead of the viewing, I wanted it to be more experiential rather than, just a passive viewing of our work. I wanted people to feel it. I wanted it to maybe hurt a little. You know, I wanted it to be exciting or be either abrasive or beautiful, like whatever ebb and flow that the sounds needed to be in order to generate those kinds of emotions. I was really hoping that we could achieve that, and I think in some ways we have. But the audience is also teaching us a lot, which right. is really and exciting course, about. That's where that sort of metaphor for community comes in, because right. it's not only about, oh, well, I'll just pick up this instrument instead of looking at it. It's about you know maybe a larger like well why don't you you know uh, 
thinking about maybe contribute to the community instead of complaining about it or et cetera, something like that. Or making a new community. Mm-hmm. Yeah, instead of just looking back and, mm-hmm. and repeating what other, the other models. Mm-hmm. And Valerie, I'll oh, go ahead. Oh, I just had a question. Because like, you could also not expect anything from anything. Yes. So, so why expect something to be right. you know? And I just wanted to, to put, to put, you know, to post that Why expect what? Anything to begin with. You know, like, people, you know, you might just say, oh, what of, is, why have it's just expe- hard not to. What, like, <laughs> yeah. Why have expectations of the audience? Yeah, is that like what you're why, asking? You know, sometimes you could just create a situation and maybe or may not have any type of, of reaction. You know, well, we don't know. Happen. I mean, yeah. that, you know, a minute ago, Valerie used the word generate, and we think about this space as generative we're thinking about you know there are things that we don't know there are things that we are experimenting with there you know what happens when that's what we do in a studio an artist brings this stuff like a scientist and says what happens when you put this against this against this and so we don't know we can't predict that um but but what school teaches you to try (laughs) <laughs> for sure. Oh, to know. <laughs> it's sort to of, know what your audience to know will do. You, sure. But you can't when you're doing, right. you know, yeah, you can't. I mean, if you're experimenting, you can't. Like, you can measure, you can see, you know, there are measurable things that you can see a past in, you know. Um, but I think this history or the history that we belong to is, is new enough not to be able to predict as much, you know exactly what and we have different contexts you know we could do this in an amphitheater we could do this outside we could do this here we could do and each time the audience is going to respond in a different way and so when to i want to answer the question why why is more selfish why is more about bringing the artist into one play, you know, bringing the artist back to that introduction and bringing the artist that we want to work with, using this space and exploiting it for all we can, um, and to generate new work. And so what's happening, and, and this leads us to the next point, is that this space is generating new work. So, um, for example, when we uh, brought the first... Um, three other artists, Molly uh, Zuckerman Hartung and Christy Gast and Mindy Abovitz and the two of us. Um, we have one day, <laughs> right, like one, one day to be in the space together and to write a score with all the interruptions of what's going on in Locust and so-and-so wants to talk to you, somebody wants to take a picture of you, somebody wants to, you know, and we have this one day to be with these people that we wanted to be with and work with. And so it took us all day long. She didn't, she didn't answer anything. She didn't respond <laughs> to anything. Um, the, we, it took, you know, we, we took one day, but even by the end of the day, we didn't have a score yet. We didn't get to a score until the last five minutes. <laughs> and then somebody was like, somebody wants to interview you. Somebody wants to take me. And we're like, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> tomorrow we have to do this for the public, and how are we going to do that? Um, but it happened right at the end of an eight-hour day. And, um, and this is a poetic uh, interpretation of the score. So I'm going to read that to you. The ship, or the beginning of the first score. The ship, the sound of breath amplified and tuned by volumes of water in ceramic jugs shaped like cool mountains. The low bass, screeching of bows against stainless steel piano wire, imagining, envisioning, seeing, perceiving. The image of a ship as it moves through icy ocean terrain. The muffled and exhausted sound of metal against hardened ice. The dripping of melting. The melting glacier continues, sustains, pervasive, perpetual, constant, slowly disappearing ice. The ship can be heard by mermaids as they wail, filtered and distant, soft, throaty melancholia. And so we, we, you know, um, all together, after talking about feminism, after talking about... um, 
uh, our own practices and catching up with each other and making, you know, forming a, a tiny community ourselves, um, we started to speak our, each other's language and we understood, you know. And so, so we were able to produce um, three separate scores of a symphony, right? And, and we performed it the next day for this brand new audience in this brand new space and some of us were brand new to each other and um, some things worked and some things didn't. Um, but our next question is how would you describe an economy of collaboration? How would you describe an economy of collaboration? Friction. Friction? Yeah. I think you need to have like divergent opinions mm -hmm. in order to have like checks and balances. Oh, you also need um, things to be at stake. So um, my reputation is based on Alan's, which is based on yours, which is based on Bill's projects, which is based on whatever else. So mm -hmm. we all have things to share with each other, things we need each other for. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. That's exactly how it worked out when we were planning the show. You know, all the organizing and getting from the beginning to the end, from one seed of an idea and a past that Valerie and I share of 20 years, and doing, you know, this whole thing. And so, um, the economy was about, the economy that we built was about um, uh, sharing resources, you know, what does each person have to offer? Um, so we start with an idea, we have this, you have that, um, this artist has this, this artist has that, and then all of a sudden we have a $15,000 project and 10 artists flying into Locust Projects and um, doing this thing, you know, which again is generative. It's, it, it will, you know, um, through conversations like this, hopefully, you know, um, there's a new body of knowledge that's produced. Um, so, <laughs> does anybody have anything to say about that? I mean, I mean, do you feel uh, about collaboration in general? Do, do any of you collaborate in your own work or or? I mean, how do you all collaborate? It's, it is a form of play. Uh huh. You do have to sort of release a little bit of your own material. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to vibe with the person. Mm -hmm. So it's like the collaboration. Yes. It's a very special combination. Resonance you know, and authorship. There's a rhythm and it's a rhythm. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like, like um, drawing sessions together. Mm -hmm. It's a relationship. It's a relationship. But it should be. I think that's idealistic. I don't think it's always joyful. But if you know that the pain is to for productions, for, for, you know, for the purpose of the production, then I think everybody's willing to feel that feel that pain. And um, um, and and suddenly, like my standard and her standard were uh, of our work were sharp. You know, when you do your own work, you are taking your you know you know what your time uh, you know what your sort of uh, time frame is. So. Well, not you know time yourself, frame, but like how you work. You have your own limits. You know that you are cool yeah. if you know you have one day left to get your final edits done, or if you have one day left to write the whole piece, or if you need to. You know, whatever you need to do, you know that. But when you're working with somebody else, you're you're out of joint because you're trying to, and then you either accommodate them or you make them accommodate you, and then you're it's it's, a diff it's really amazing. But mm -hmm. of course, good amazing things come out of it that would not come out of you. Exactly. 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 Yeah. I was wondering why you included economy because we could have had that same conversation just about collaboration. But you know, what is the Why didn't you just prompt it with collaboration? And what was your interest in the economy of collaboration? Well, 
I don't, I think they go hand in hand. You can't, like, there's an economy of everything. There's an economy in any, there's a system for any exchange. process or exchange. Exchanges. Yeah. So it's defined by exchange. Is that how you guys are thinking about economy? Yes. Maybe we should look at Well, yeah. we're going to, you know, <laughs> that's we talked about that's that, why it's here because is. it's so complicated and so yeah. loaded and so I mean we can you can read you can visit the text <laughs> but the text goes the text goes um, it it follows the etymology of the word economy uh -huh. and it starts with the Latin economia and it does and, and then it explain you know it explains economy um, as it evolved and so I don't, we're definitely not here to do that. Sure. Um, but I think that economy, and I, I'll, I'll just, I'll paraphrase one of my professors in grad school <laughs> that said, if you don't know anything about economy, then you don't know anything. And I will never forget that. It's burned into my brain, like the, you know, the debt, the, what do they put on your, Rest in peace or whatever, like <laughs> epitaph. <laughs> if you don't know anything about economy, then you don't know anything. Wow. And 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 I have um, absorbed that and believe that it's true um, for all practical purposes of not defining what truth is. So, um, economy is very important to uh, any system, any progress, any grouping of anything yeah. um it's, and, it's, it's like literally i mean we, certainly we could talk about the collaboration of like energy and effort but like we were also still talking in very like traditional loaded economic terms about money who can donate what who can share what you know time equals money for some of these folks and they're giving it away in this situation and not some really all people uh, yeah <laughs> you know, I mean, time is money i'm supposed to be teaching the class right now <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and there, earning that money. There's, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. a there has been a lot of like economic give and give and take there too. But um, I think that when we but we're not talking about money. No, we're, we're not, definitely we're not talking about money. Mm. Well, there's um, there's both in there. There's 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 um, in if I'm gonna take it from Francis Dyson's point of view. There's, there are the two ecos, economy and ecology, and they're intertwined. You have to um, consider both, you know. So, um, so I mean, the, que the, the original question, how would you describe an economy of collaboration? What is the economy of collaboration? What is being traded? What is being given? What is being, um, you know, so, it, it, you know, the values go from money to um, ideas you know, authorship, um, the, 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 uh, the system and the structure that you have to work, the limits that you're inside of, and this bigger, larger economy. Um, what is the economy of art versus what is the economy of this uh, presentation, this exhibition? So, you know, there's a counter to um, capitalism. I think that's operating, and there's an economy. There's economy that is not based on, you know, it's based on what you have and what you give, um, and it's a giving kind of economy. So, you know, again, it's back to you. It's really I want to know what you think that means. I guess I'm more interested in like when you choose not to cooperate. Okay. I feel like I've come from a contest before where like well, everybody wants to like make things together and like change the world and sometimes I do feel like you know this is a very big generalization which is just so problematic. Sometimes I feel like um, uh, in the states people are so like um, uh, they they prize so much their privacy like there's an excessiveness of like artists. Like, People, people. Mm -hmm. privacy. I won't say, pro I would say individualism. Maybe, and yeah. That there's like a moment where like collaboration just doesn't, you know, people kind of, you know, like doesn't occur. Not even, not even for the sake of creating something that is completely futile and completely like, you know, because we can all 
collaborate to fail, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Not even that. Like, mm -hmm. but. Well, sometimes people are altruistic in giving, of course, for their own self-interest. And so perhaps being giving, you know, because it benefits one person or another, you know, that's motivating. Um, because I think what's interesting about altruism is that there's always, you know, people give and give and give, and whether or not they, um, whether or not they may say it or think it, they might be expecting something in return, whether that's simple gratitude or, so I think, I think it's very, I think with collaboration, you often encounter this very difficult aspect, which is self-interest. Yeah, you're always fighting an expectation. Yes, mm -hmm. and so, I mean, I think that is this inevitable thing you encounter when you, group, when, when you, when you collaborate, mm -hmm. um, is this, um, perhaps not on the surface. Do you think that's because of our conditioning as no. Americans and as Western, and or do you think that's part of human nature? Well, I mean, that's an awesome big question. <laughs> I think, um, I personally, I think that it's a, a human nature thing. Yeah, I think altruism is one of the most complicated, complex, sentiments we have, um, unless you're Mother Teresa, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, don't, I, don't I think that's key, though. I think a lot of it, you could make an argument that it's very religious, like it comes from this idea of oh, sure. uh, like Christianity, you know, practice of, of giving, and yeah. especially Protestant, like, sure. what you're giving for a really specific reason. Exactly. Right, what are you giving for? Yeah, we're yeah, we're back off. But yeah, I think that's a broader off the topic thing as well. It's like a tangent. Or tangential, I maybe. maybe. I mean it's in there. Yeah, but you yeah, you there's gotta be generosity and collaboration, correct? Right. Okay. So that's simple. Um you know, um but I think it gets obviously more complex as it grows and you know moves in its own direction I think you're always like negotiating it's like you know Valerie and I get together we have this idea and then it becomes its own monster and starts to build its own self the way that in the direction it wants to go and I think that's like um, again part of listening to your own practice and listening to your own material as an artist so um, let's get back to a little bit of text and more whiskey. And more whiskey. <laughs> okay, you be the server. Anybody? Pythagoras. Oh, that guy. <laughs> Pythagoras discovered the monochord and in the process set Western harmony on the road to abstraction. And I think this is relevant with this whole direction. The monochord outlined what were harmonic and therefore correct acoustic intervals according to mathematical and therefore rational relations. The simple equivalence between acoustic and mathematical rationality was to spawn a cosmology that defined the tone as a relation rather than a sound. And I want to I want to use the, the word tone as a metaphor for a person. Um, the tone as a relation rather than a sound the musical note as a discrete unit of sound and harmony itself as a manifestation of divine order. There were, however, a multitude of problems with Pythagoreanism, not least of which was the debate between unity and multiplicity and music's membership in either category, issues that would occupy music scholars for centuries. The question of music's status as a multitude or magnitude and indeed the ontological status of multiplicity as opposed to unity or the one, would prepare the ground for the increasing mathematization of the universe. 
It would also designate an area of being as a remainder, being as a remainder. The incommensurable and incommensurability, per se, that resulted from the profusion of ratios that flourished as Pythagoreans attempted to reconcile dissonance in music within a rationally ordered universe. And so, you know, I would like to use that uh, a lot more poetically and, and use tone as, as a metaphor for the individual. You know, and the fact that Pythagoras was trying to um, unitize sound and to say that a sound can be a discrete thing and then it can be added, subtracted, multiplied, divided. But it was never evenly. It couldn't be done evenly. It was incommensurable. So, you know, <laughs> if it's brought back to this idea of economy and community and, and things being divisible equally, that's a, that's, it's suggested that that's impossible. It's suggested that, you know, the rules of mathematics apply if you, um, if you think of the, the little bit of extra that doesn't fit as uh, an anomaly as something to be ignored. So, Is that what you read that twice? Did I read that twice? Well, the being as a remainder. Being as a remainder, yeah, because, you know, it, it's like, in, in philosophy, you're thinking about being, right, and what is the meaning of being, and what is that all about, and, and this is saying being, um, using being in a couple of different ways, and it's just really, you know, interesting to, to see that language fluctuate, and and start to resonate in other ways and mean other things, you know, mm -hmm. especially out of context. Mm -hmm. So thinking about um, uh, the manifestation of a divine order, you know, making order out of everything. <laughs> you know, it's absurd, right? It's just right. an absurdity. But science, it's useful for science and it's useful for music. But the reality here is that music is only beautiful and because it's uneven, because it has dissonance, right? And so why can't we uh, kind of highlight that dissonance and look for that in our personal relationships and, and in our, you know, art practices? You know, it's like the happy mistake, you know, when you fuck up your painting and you learn from that and then you... <laughs> You know, it, and and then it, it's it is feedback. feedback. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I love feedback. It's been the most interesting part of the last month for me. So, economy, a complex organism composed of heterogeneous relations entwined with each other through economic relations that are linked by a paradigm that we could define as administrative. What is gestionally? Gestion. Just oh, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Oh, oh I wow. Love the feedback loop. Um, and not epistemic. In other words, it is a matter of an activity that is not bound to a system of rules and does not constitute a science in the proper sense. And if we go back specifically to our collaboration and the artists that we're working with and the things that we're trying to achieve, you know, we're thinking of this as. Um, Don't know you know, a system without rules. We're thinking of it like nobody has um, the throw away the mission statement when, you know, the new artists come in. So this week we'll have two more artists that are coming here on Wednesday and Thursday and we'll work with them for the remainder of the week and see how the exhibition changes based on that interaction and create a part of a new score. So, um, so anyway, it, it goes, it kind of serves two purposes. It, it talks about economy as a complex organism and then it, or, um, or the structure upon which the complex organism is arranged, you know, um, and what it depends on, right? So, and that leans back towards collaboration. <laughs> what else? I just kept going back to her use of the word organic, mm -hmm. um, and that was so poignant because in order for those, for any collaboration to sort of function and function well, 
they, it, it, it's not mathematical necessarily, it's not scientific necessarily, it can't necessarily be pinpointed. And what I think makes um, the process that we're going through interesting is the fact that it's so organic and we are really in a major effort um, <laughs> trying very hard not to control its yes. death, not to um, observe outcomes and have expectations, to really sort of let it be um, what it's going to be within a certain set of parameters. Like we knew we had X, Y, and Z. What happens once um, we set 10 people in the room with X, Y, and Z? Who knows? And, right, and uh, yeah, we had to take a, a measured risk. Yeah, definitely. And I don't know if we're going to run out of time. I know that we have to watch it, but... Um, we're at um, 8.30, we finished, so it's... Okay. okay. I think it'd be great to make sounds with this movie, too. Yeah. Oh, we're gonna. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's what, what the, the whiskey's, whiskey's for. for. <laughs> <laughs> See, all so, the 20 years. So <laughs> we're going to take some time afterwards yes. to play. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> um... So what's the feedback role? The feedback role? Uh, the role of feedback? <laughs> uh, to, to, to make us crazy? Okay. Um, to to be, break our to logic? Be, to bring us to the kid, kid day? Yeah. Okay. Give us agency? All right. Yeah. Lower our commission? Yeah. Well. So what's that? What's the kind of And it's part of the story. It's part of a narrative. Breaking the logic of the virtual voice. So uh, this actually <laughs> again points back to um, Alan and his his um, comment about social media, the web, virtual space, the idea of the voice um, being really unheard. It's being seen. It's not really being heard. Um, maybe we think that we're being heard. Like on if we say something on Facebook, look, I ate this today. You know, who hears that? Is it just like an empty echo, or is it actually content that anybody? Well, that I was thinking about uh, that actually. With, digest. Because I was like, the graphic design was such a big thing, and I was like, uncomfortable with it being a thing. Being so visual. Like it's just the text. But it's why supposed to be need, just the text. Why yeah. Why do we need the color? Why do we yeah. need the font? Yeah. 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 The text. Yeah. But. But everybody's bored with that, Alan. Line. If it's just <laughs> black and white, you know, and lines on a page, no, it's not entertaining enough. That's not true, though. Nobody just reads the text the way the text is laid out. No, it's they don't. Well, everyone like, keeps telling me how great it looks. They're like, oh, the journal looks great. <laughs> well, that was, I'm like, but <laughs> what about the content, right? <laughs> what about the content? Line. Is there content, right? Um, so back to the voice. Um, <laughs> What is voice? What do you what do you what would you say voice is? Power. 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 So does Francis Dyson. Yeah. She yeah. Does. Big yeah. lettuce. Um, what else is voice? Like how how is voice manifested now? It's an attempt at clarity. Oh, okay. It's an attempt at clarity. It's a what? Ears. Voice hears. But if there's only one of you and you speak, who hears you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you whether you hear your own voice or not, your own agency is determined by your own Yeah. There's a question about there's a question about the individual as alone and one, and community as a um, as a multiplicity or people as a multi multiplicity. Um, there's a question about you know um, the emptiness and the echo of the void, um, and hearing your you know saying something but not being heard because there's no one there to hear it. Um, I don't know, you know, I, I think it's just about asking what it is now, like, if in one way Alan was saying that that voice is heard through media, you know, like, 
communities are made in social media and virtual space um, through the voice and that voice is like um, it's a moot voice um, and so it, you know there's just a question there how, how you know is it how much reality is there? How much community is really there if there are no bodies there? If you're bodiless, you know? Um, the Arab Spring happened. Um, that's a good example, you know, right? I mean, action out of activism, out of, you know, a, a multitude of voices. A lot of the scholarship around uh, social media points to the fact that, um, uh, of course, the uh, activity online. Um, it only um, ha it, 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 it can only be measurable if uh, actual if it's actualized. So, like if someone goes and you know, right, for Arab Spring or ISIS, um, you know, uh, recruits people online, or mm -hmm. um, uh, people uh, meet their husband or their wife, or someone they meet a whole new group of friends, or they go out, you know, jam with a group of people who like to jam. Then they didn't know before. So I guess there's big They big still have to get together. Right. There's arguments that, of course, social media is powerful only until it's a tool to actualize something. And then, and it does a great job of that, actually. Yeah. A, a tool of communication. A tool of um, activation or actualization, I okay. guess. Put up here, Terry uh, Sherry Turkle writes a really great book or essay called "Alone Together," which is um, why we expect more from technology and less from each other. Um, she has a couple of great TED talks too, which are super fun. But um, again, um, I do think that there's an argument to be made for a, that's a little bit um, like one one shift over from what she's trying to get at which is what you're talking about, like it can, especially for generations younger than her and me, um, people are finding ways to really activate lots of cultural spin-offs from their personal world. I mean, they're really achieving a great deal by using social media. Um, but I think there's still a lot of, to be learned in terms of like the quality of that activation like how it functions but or what are the qualities what are they and you know we're in a really interesting time in our lives I think to have these discussions swimming around in our heads it's, it's an interesting moment absolutely I w mm -hmm. when um, I was on a recent I was in the park somewhere in New York and um, and my friend and I were together and and we noticed these kids like gathering into the park and they were all dressed as um, characters of some kind and like they were all in weird costumes and they're like meeting each other based on this game and they're all coming into the park to be um, to play out the parts of the game yeah, like avatars game. Yeah. yeah and we're like realizing wow you know this is a real um, life uh, manifestation of that virtual reality that these kids like get into and become part of and think is real. Right, not to mention things like Second Life, which. Yeah, well, yeah. You know it's not real. Right. You know it's not real, but maybe they think it's real. You know, I don't know, because what would a 15 year old's idea of real be co as compared to ours? You know, and what is real? Is That's. Is woo! Like, in Second yeah. Life, you can pay each other in Bitcoin and, and <laughs> yeah. you can go cash yeah. out some real money. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But, um, yeah, you know, it's, I bet those people, I wonder if they met online. Because then they, they, yeah, they met through the game, the right. interactions. And, now, and then they're all together, actually. So then they yeah. actually meet in real yeah. time yeah. and space and, and they... Yeah, yeah, I'm guessing. Word of mouth? Mm -hmm. yeah. Everybody else heard word of mouth? I don't know. Online? Yeah. Word of mouth? Mm -hmm. Oh, we're just wondering. <laughs> okay. I want to read to you again. Is that okay? okay? Here we go. <laughs> okay. Um, it, here, it, this is sort of out of context, but it, it's, it's pretty good. Um, 
Division, separation, and multiplication manifest in fractured media and politics as the repetitive and often nonsensical gibberish of political speech, the fragmentation of financial entities, and the negative equations and formula that constitute economic growth. That's back to economy. The other eco, ecology, is captured by modeling and simulation, casting the experience of climate change within the banks of big data, while the actuality of the weather, its day-to-day -day record breaking presence, becomes catastrophes alias, providing perfect storms to explain the often methodical larceny that is occurring in these times of multiple crises. It is only on the ground within the reverberative echoic space of bodies that this weather is experienced, that its furor is heard as ominous sound, the rumbling, the crash, the scream, rather than a potential item of news to be repeated on the hour, creating a highly mediated, controlled, and detached unity through disaster. So, you know, I think it's sort of the, the word unity also circles back to community and sort of the um, how media, this type of media or this, this voice of media creates a, a kind of community and what kind is that, I think, is what we're questioning a little bit of um, the body in space, in real space, and as it relates to the bodies next to it versus, you know, um, the other. So what do you guys think? And we talk about the internet here? Well, um, it's, it's talking about mediated voice. It's talking about um, the repetition, you know, say of, say of one story, you know, when you see, when you're uh, living in a mediated universe, you know, or of knowledge, then it's how do you receive that knowledge through repetition? The story gets told over and over and over and over and over again in seemingly, probably, possibly the same voice. You know, um, often Fox is, is just directly quoting CNN or, you know, somebody else is directly quoting somebody else and then all of a sudden, you know, you think you heard a story um, but you, you weren't there, you don't know. And so what is the difference between that experience of what happened, what really happened, like and, you know, like being, copy. exactly, Oh, being being yeah. who you know being in the body and feeling the scream hearing the scream feeling the rumbling you there's know an authenticity there's an authenticity to right. that absolutely yeah. absolutely and and so you know <laughs> i think um again it goes back to you know um a bot an embodied experience uh versus a mediated experience and what you know, does voice have to do with that? Like, you know, it's big, but but the idea, I, I guess, the main question is really, what is goes right. back to what is voice? Right. Voice is now. like so unmediated, right? Like to, to go to even use that, it's like you, there's no there's no fake in it. So if you're there's yeah, I mean you could sing it to a synthesizer, but um. yeah, and I think the mic piece really. Um, plays with that in a material way and saying, you know, uh, when you sing into a certain thing, it has an effect on it and you really can't hear yourself, you know? So it's sort of like reverberating that idea. I, guess, I guess I feel like um, what we experience now with like our generation of media, it's probably similar to the way that people a hundred years ago felt when the crank machine was made. Mm -hmm. So you can make a bunch of books everybody could, you know, that was like huge, you know? mm -hmm. so I feel like one thing should not negate the other, like I feel like just because we have more access to information and it can be, you know, like digested and diluted so fa at a faster pace than the printing press, it doesn't mean that the period of the voice is um, less or avoided or even negated, like, I think that they're functioning at different levels. Because mm -hmm. ultimately, I think that nothing, even, even just to bring that up, 
very um, kind of cliche and um, savvy set example. The scene, Obama, like, on YouTube, it's not like the same as seeing him, like, in person. So, I don't know. But do you feel like you know him? Hell no. <laughs> He's the no. most calmest, like, person that I see. <laughs> he makes jokes, you know, he has, like, the perfect marriage. Hell no, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> There yeah, can be yeah, more yeah. or less yeah. human. <laughs>
portraits made and you know you would go and you would perform you would dress up so you would look how you wanted to be presented and you know if you look at old photographs of people in your family all you really see is how they wanted you to see those right yeah. 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 right even, like early women's performance like video art performance like Joan Jonas doing a lot of like Yeah, it's a moment of discovery. It's it's you are discovering yourself when you hear your voice right. echoing in the room again. Without being able to like, set the lighting and curate the image you want to represent you at that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like a like um, I I sort of equivocate a, a lot of what you're talking about to just pure narcissism. It, it, you know, I just how many ways can I look at myself, and that's really boring. Um, to me, um, but the idea of rediscovering your own body and hearing your own voice at, at amplify um, or, you know, a, a cause and effect boom, you know, I did this with my body and then I heard this sound happen um, is so fundamental and so, you know, basic to human embodiment yeah. that, um, I just think it's just gorgeous to go back there and just try, you know, go back to the cave and like yeah. hear yourself or see, you know, look at your shadow, sure. you know, and think about that and experience it. We don't get in, you know, we're, we are living in a virtual world. We are often too sped up. Right, so we're totally so this is sort of like, yeah this give you the chance it to just get backs it. you up yeah. and yeah yeah it doesn't give you the chance to package already no mm -hmm. but i mean presenting that personal i think it's more humility i think it requires a lot more humility and a lot more um openness and um, humanity to be and vulnerability to be um, exposed that way and you know if if we're really going back to studio practice and being an artist and thinking about you know um, just the way all the different ways that that artists do work you know um, you can be alone and then you get to put the paintings on the wall and then you get to walk away. You never have to be, you don't want to, you never have to be seen. And part of being seen is acknowledging, you know, what's there. I think, and seen in a real way, not your best way. You know, um, the one that, you know, nobody can see your double chin, the, a real way in flesh, you know. Um, and bringing it down to the level of the floor versus the level of a stage. Um, there's just, to me, uh, uh, an access um, there, an accessibility there that, that isn't there otherwise. Do you think that's necessary? No, I think, it's, I think that's just what we want this art to be, you know. Um, I think that getting back to something that is um, just direct, you know, the kind of conversations that we have when we're in face-to-face -face, um, in the room with the artists that we are working with versus the kind of conversation we might try to instigate, you know, for example, we tried to sort of instigate um, a conversation with all of us over email and nobody wants to do that, you know? And 
And so we get to capture these moments um, of, you know, FaceTime and then they're gone, you know. And so we have to sort of really capitalize on those, that time. Um, I think I'm way off now. I think that I think <laughs> we do have to, is talking. We're going to have okay. to wrap yeah, up. So, we're going to kind of um, just extend and play for a few minutes. And thank you so much to both of you. Absolutely. <laughs>